It would be impossible to talk about the history of psychology without mentioning Sigmund Freud. Born in Vienna in 1856 to a lower middle class Jewish family, Freud was able to gradually rise through the ranks and become a world renowned professor and psychiatrist. His life has been written about so many times that it is hard to separate fact from the legend that has grown around his colossal character. While working towards his medical degree, he studied under Dr. Ernest Bruck for six years. While studying at Bruck's Institute, he became acquainted with Dr. Joseph Brewer, a colleague that would become a close friend of Freud's. Freud earned his medical degree in March of 1881 and became a teaching assistant at Bruck's laboratory, while simultaneously conducting his own research on physiology. After working in the laboratory for six years, Freud suddenly left his scientific research to become a practicing physician. Newly married and working a low-paying residency in a hospital, Freud's life was far from easy. During his residency, he tried his hand in multiple specialties, but in 1883, he began his career in neurology. In the following year, he began his research on what was then believed to be a harmless wonder drug, cocaine. He used it himself as well as conducted experiments with it and even published papers about its clinical usefulness. In 1885, Freud was awarded the title of Privat Design, which allowed him to teach at universities. He then left the hospital he had been working at to go to Paris to study at the Salpetriere under the famous physician Jean Martin Charcot. Freud only spent a short time at the Salpetriere, after which he did a short stint in the military. Afterwards, back in Vienna, he started practicing as a neurologist. In 1886, Freud published the first of many controversial papers. His theory on male hysteria challenged the commonly held viewpoint on what constituted hysteria in men and sparked much debate. Still relatively unknown, Freud's private practice was slow and he struggled to support his growing family. In 1887, he finally gave up on his studies of cocaine and in 1889, he returned to France this time to study under the famous Hippolyte Bernheim at the Nancy School. In 1895, Freud and his colleague Joseph Brewer published their Studies on Hysteria, which was widely regarded as Freud's first successful work. During this time period, Freud's father died and he began to experience his own mental health issues. While contending with his own neurosis and analyzing himself, he began to develop many theories that would one day grow into psychoanalysis. It was around this time that he first began to interpret dreams as well. He continued to develop his theory of the psychosexual stages of development, and in 1898 began writing perhaps his most famous book, The Interpretation of Dreams. Here, Ellenberger defines this transformative period as a creative illness due to the deep psychological work he was able to do while suffering from his own ailments. We will see this creative illness again in the video on Carl Jung. With the success of the Interpretation of Dreams published in 1900, Freud had officially put himself on the map. And by 1902, he was awarded the prestigious title of Extraordinary Professor, and he began to gather followers interested in his psychoanalysis. Among the first followers was Alfred Adler, whom we will have a whole video on down the line. In 1905, one of his best known works was published, Three Essays on Sexuality, solidifying his theory of psychosexual development. In 1907, the psychoanalysis movement gained two major physicians, Ludwig Binswanger and Carl Jung. Adler broke away from psychoanalysis in 1911 to form his own movement, but psychoanalysis continued to grow. It wasn't until 1913 when Jung and the rest of the Swiss physicians broke away that the movement took a big hit. Freud continued to publish many famous books and grow his influence. In 1923, Freud developed cancer in his jaw and had to have it partially removed, 
after which he had to wear a prosthesis. By now, Freud had achieved world fame. Psychoanalysis continued to grow until 1933 when Hitler took power and started burning books. Freud was forced to flee his homeland in 1938 and took refuge in London. One year later, at the age of 83, Freud died peacefully in his son's London apartment. Let us now take a closer look at Freud's actual theories. The contemporary definition of libido is sexual desire. To Freud, it was so much more than that. Freud's conception of sexuality goes beyond normal sexual instinct and includes all the manifestations of psychosexual energy. The contemporary biological view of that time was that libido was a natural urge synonymous with hunger and that this sexual urge did not manifest until the child hit puberty. According to Freud, this theory could not explain what he was objectively observing in his clinical practice. His theory of psychosexual stages of development remains controversial to this day. Many scholars, including a few of Freud's own disciples, rejected much of what he had to say on infantile sexuality. However, without the ingenious innovations of psychoanalysis, there is no saying how long it would have taken the academic community to establish a foundational theory to build upon. One would be hard-pressed to find any post-Freudian theory that did not borrow at least some elements from psychoanalysis. If we are to understand the developmental aspect of psychoanalysis, we must first understand why Freud dismissed the contemporary definition of libido. In his view, libido as a sexual desire could be broken down into two parts, sexual object and sexual aim. However, he deviated from the contemporary view with his notion that this libido was active from birth onwards and that the investiture of this childhood libido was crucial in shaping the sexuality of the adult. Many people in the medical fraternity outright rejected this theory, but it was Freud's colleague Carl Jung who best defended it. Jung argued that all instincts are present at the time of birth, and this includes the sexual instinct. Furthermore, in a gestalt-like fashion, he explains how it is futile to separate the instincts into separate drives. Instead, Jung suggests that we can better understand the libido of Freud's interpretation as the mental energy of instinct itself, something more akin to willpower. Jung goes on to explain when psychoanalysis was in its infancy, they believed that all neuroticism in the adult stemmed from an actual physical childhood sexual trauma. However, Freud eventually scrapped this theory and the term psychosexual trauma replace the more stereotypical definition of trauma. This, Jung explains, means that something as simple as a fantasy could be traumatizing to the child and nothing had to happen outside of their own mind. Now that we have established the Freudian perspective of libido, the next key to understanding psychosexual development is a firm grasp of what Freud defines as neuroticism. By his definition, neuroticism does not affect a distinct entity of people, rather it is a matter of degree. This means that everyone is neurotic to some extent. According to Freud, on one hand, we have the child who has invested too much sexual impulse into an object, which leads to perversions and fetishes later in life, and on the other hand we have the child who does not invest enough impulse into objects which leads to excessive sexual repression, causing hysterical and neurotic symptoms. It is only when the child gets through the stages of psychosexual development in a normal way that the ratio of uncontrolled sexual impulse and sexual repression are in balance, thus leading to a normal, healthy sex life. Freud's theory of psychosexual development starts with infantile sexuality. To any reader that is unfamiliar with psychoanalytic theory, this sounds ridiculous. However, Jung tells us we can understand this easily if one were to consider that this infantile sexuality does not result in a sexual goal, as an infant sex organs are not completely developed yet. Instead, he suggests infantile sexuality is the untapped stores of libidinal energy, or in other words, 
the inherent sexual instinct that the child is born with. The unconscious nature of the childhood libido is why any fixation that may occur during development does not manifest as neurotic symptoms until much later in the adult life. During infantile development, the child will invest this energy into various objects that are not sexual in nature. This is natural, and if the child continues to develop and reinvest that energy into new objects, they will end up normal. However, if the child fixates on a non-sexual object and does not reinvest this energy by the time they hit puberty, they will sexualize the fixation, causing perversions and fetishes. Later in his career, Freud expanded on how this infantile sexuality became one of the foundational substructures of the ego itself. When an infant is born, he explains, they are unable to differentiate between their own ego and the outside world. This separation of internal and external world starts when the infant gradually learns of the various sensations they experience, such as the displeasure of hunger and the pleasure that follows as the result of feeding. Freud suggests that two crucial things are beginning to happen, the first being that the infant is starting to develop a conception of their body as a distinct entity, and the second being, they begin to distinguish their first experience of an external object in the form of the mother slash breast. Coincidentally, this process happens because of the pleasure-seeking instinct, an instinct that Freud believes will one day evolve into the sex drive. In healthy development, the child can redirect their sexual energy onto a new non-sexual aim in a process called sublimation. Failure to sublimate enough of this sexual energy can lead to traumatizing fantasies that the child must repress. Freud denotes that even if the child successfully sublimates this energy, it still emanates from the erogenous zones. Although Freud tells us that any area on the body could theoretically become an erogenous zone, Certain areas are predestined to become erogenous at certain stages of development. Therefore, development from a psychoanalytical perspective has discontinuous stages, meaning that once one is complete, they move on to the next stage, which is completely different qualitatively speaking. Freud's first example of this concept is, during the infantile period, the child's mouth becomes the erogenous zone. This happens, he theorizes, because of classical conditioning. The child must use their mouth to suck, whether it be on the mother's breast or a bottle, to receive their nourishment. The satiation caused by feeding is a pleasurable sensation for the child. Although the child's pleasure is initially derived from the milk itself, the child associates the act of sucking with the pleasure of feeding. Nature conditions the child to perceive sucking as a pleasurable experience. Thus, the child begins to look for an object to use as a stand-in for the breast or bottle. The child will stimulate this erogenous zone, usually in an autoerotic fashion, most commonly in the form of sucking their own thumb. They do not do this because of the nutritive aspect of feeding, but rather in a comparable manner as masturbation. Hence the continuation of thumb sucking despite the lack of nutrition derived from it. Freud mentions that once the child establishes an erogenous zone, it sticks with them for life. And we can see this later in life in the custom of the widespread practice of kissing as a form of foreplay. In this sense, the oral stage is its own stage of development and the preceding stages do not build upon it. The oral stage ends when the child's teeth start to come in around the end of their first year, and the child's parents wean them off the breast or bottle, thus beginning the process of transferring the oral manifestation of the libido onto a new erogenous zone. The predestined erogenous zone for the next stage is the anus. This stage begins with the child is around one year old and ends around the age of three. Although Freud does not outright state that the anal stage is due to the coinciding potty training during this age range, he does point out that a clear sign of child's anal fixation is their utter refusal to make a bowel movement in front of anyone during potty training. It would, however, make perfect sense, 
With potty training comes the concept of controlling the bowels, a process that can cause pleasure. Freud explains that by holding in the fecal matter for extended periods of time, the child will begin to experience muscle contractions, and due to the sensitivity of the anal region, this can be quite pleasurable. Finally, passing the bowel movement after holding it in so long may cause pain at first, but the relief felt afterward is also pleasurable. This stage of development is a sensitive period and many neurotic disorders can develop. The holding in of fecal matter to stimulate this erogenous zone inevitably leads to accidents. The child may relieve themselves while in bed or later in the stage while at preschool. Social factors play a much larger role in the suppression of the anal manifestation of the libido, along with psychic factors such as shame, hence the higher risk for the development of neuroticism. The next stage in development is the phallic stage, which happens between the ages of 3 and 6. At this stage, the erogenous zone becomes the genitals. However, it is important to note that the pleasure that comes from the stimulation of the genitals at this point is not of a conventional sexual nature. Still ignorant of the act of sex, the child does not associate the pleasure derived from the genitals with other people or the act of sexual intercourse. According to Freud, this stage is a critical period. This is because, as Jung points out, that this stage is when the first memories are starting to form. Having said that, if the child were to witness their parents having sexual intercourse at this stage, or if the child were suddenly to learn that the other sex has different genitals, these events could lead to several complexes. To Freud, these complexes were completely due to psychosexual trauma, and the guilt caused by the child's sexual fantasy involving one of the parents. This fantasy would last but a fleeting moment in most cases and be immediately repressed into the unconscious. However, this is enough to create an unconscious motivation that could lead to one of the previously mentioned complexes. The later psychoanalysis expanded on the theory of these complexes inspired by Freud's later work where he acknowledges the existence of a death instinct. Many of the post-Freudian psychoanalysis believe that these complexes were caused by the child's attempt to reject the anxiety caused by this death instinct. For example, the Oedipal complex for boys or the Electra complex for girls was reinterpreted by the post-Freudians to be the child's rejection of their own passiveness and vulnerability rather than the incestuous sexual desire suggested by Freud. The child rejected this passiveness by competing with and overcoming the father or mother who they became jealous of to possess the father or mother's attention. In this sense, the child symbolically becomes their own father or mother and thus conquers their death anxiety. Failure to do this could leave the child with an unhealthy level of dependence on the parents. In most instances, the child would eventually grow out of this. However, if it were to carry into adulthood, it could manifest as an adult who never gained any independence and still relies on their parents for everything. This is also why people tend to seek out relationships in their adult life that mimic the same dynamics of their parents' relationship. Similarly, the castration complex and penis envy came about as the result of suddenly learning of the opposite sex's genitals. In both cases, the child ends up associating their death anxiety producing powerlessness with their dependence on the mother. After learning of the female anatomy and being shocked by the lack of a phallus, the boy associates the vagina with this dependence on the mother and their own powerlessness, which causes them to reject this dependence and can create an irrational fear of losing their own genitals and ending up with an anxiety producing vagina just like their mother's. Hence, the term castration complex. As far as the girl is concerned, she too associates her powerlessness with the mother's vagina and to reject it strives to become more masculine and identify with the father, causing the penis envy complex. In both instances, if the child does not outgrow these complexes, they can end up leading to fetishes in the adult life. The fourth stage of development is known as the latency stage and is also referred to as the post-Oedipal period. The child reaches the latency stage around six years old and it lasts until they hit puberty. 
At this point, the male child may experience erections, and there are plenty of reports of masturbation in children at this age. However, it is considered the latency period due to much of the child's libido being sublimated into non-sexual energy during this period. For the first time, the child is withdrawing their libido from their parents and projecting it outward into society. In normal development, this sublimation happens because the child starting grade school and having many outlets to discharge their stores of libido, such as friendships, schoolwork, and developing hobbies. Many pathological habits picked up during previous stages may temporarily disappear during the latency stage. This happens by suppressing and sublimating certain manifestations of the blossoming sexuality. Nevertheless, once a child reaches puberty and their libido goes through the qualitative changes that the sex hormones bring about, these pathological fixations may return. If the child fails to get through this stage successfully, many symptoms can occur as a result, including a lack of interest in school, homesickness, and phobias of things outside of the home life. This finally brings us to the genital stage, which starts after puberty and lasts for the duration of the adult life. To tie it all together, when a child does not develop along the proper trajectory, they end up fixating on a certain stage of their psychosexual development. This in turn can lead to any number of complexes previously mentioned or can result in hysterical or other neurotic symptoms later in life. Freud himself tells us that when this happens, when the ego forces an unfulfilled wish into the unconscious id, this process of repression causes sexual energy to build up within the id. If the child does not discharge this energy by expressing these emotions and desires consciously, then the energy goes through a process of conversion. By converting the pent up psychic energy into somatic energy, the body can then discharge this energy in the form of hysterical symptoms. The psychoanalytical solution, Freud says, is to undo this conversion process during psychoanalysis. Once the analyst transforms this somatic energy back into psychic energy, they can then bring the repressed sexual impulse to the surface. From here, it is just a matter of sorting out the source of these unconscious sexual impulses, which usually stem from some sort of psychosexual trauma in the childhood. No matter what developmental school of thought one prescribes to, we can see psychoanalytical fingerprints on some of the most core concepts. We have come a long way since the days of Freud, and many of his methods have been deemed unscientific. Some factors in Freud's theory no longer make sense in modern times, but we must not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Considering the vast amount of influence psychoanalysis has had on other schools of thought, we must be careful that we do not write it off completely as outdated. Whether we realize it or not, psychoanalysis is still shaping the way that we see the world over 100 years later.